I'm super happy that we have uh, in Freex uh, NX3D because uh, we all were jealous about your first videos. These two white robots um, crawling on top of this structure being built on a canal in uh, Amsterdam. And uh, now seeing all the changes and how they say technically developed, but also aesthetically developed. Uh, we had a good talk yesterday about that. That's really, uh, really impressive. We have here Fies, he's uh, Leeds, uh, MX3D. The interesting thing which I learned yesterday, he's actually a lawyer. I am. Oh, that's an interesting one. Worked long for an artist in an artist's uh, office, running the, uh, the company for this artist, and out of this artist, this uh, MX3D developed. And they're currently um, doing a lot of uh, research, they're doing a lot of, say, projects for others who need something special, and they're intensively working on this uh, bridge to be uh, installed. And now it's yours. Thank you. Applause. Yeah, thanks. Great to be here uh, with uh, all these uh, nice uh, large-scale 3D printing projects. Uh, hopefully a nice intermezzo with metals uh, now. So, indeed, our bridge has completely changed uh, the look. And uh, that has uh, many, many reasons. Uh, some of I will... Uh, we'll uh, talk about uh, during this lecture. But this was the presentation during uh, Dutch Design Week in uh, October 2018. So the bridge is finished, and unfortunately we're waiting for the city to, uh, to finish the work on the canal walls before we can place it. But we have heard that uh, February is a very likely date. Um, so we're uh, rounding up uh, the permit and uh, uh, hopefully uh, they, uh, they can close up the works uh, so this bridge will, uh, will be actually in use. So, we started out with a vision uh, when uh, we worked with robots that we thought uh, robots will come in and uh, start being builders on uh, the work site, doing everything fully automated, and uh, yeah, we, uh, we could step back and, and look at all these beautiful new buildings with a new aesthetics being built without our intervention. But uh, yeah, that takes a bit of work uh, before you get there, as we've seen uh, before. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of learning to be done after this first concept uh, arised, and uh, yeah, we fortunately had a bit of background with that. So uh, as already mentioned, uh, we are uh, yeah, coming from a design agency, yours, Larman Lab, and he was uh, investigating the way these new digital tools, uh, whether physical making machines or digital uh, tools that you use on the computer to design uh, are going to change the way our world looks. And of course, he focuses on uh, trying to make this uh, good design instead of uh, uh, lower cost or uh, other efficiency ideas. He wanted to experiment what kind of crazy changes this could mean. And this is one of his first projects where he, uh, together with Opel and a professor in Germany, developed an algorithm that imitates the way bones grow. And um, they, they did iterations in 2006. It still took uh, two weeks uh, for an iteration to come out. Uh, but eventually, they found a really nice, uh, naturally designed uh, way of building a chair. But of course, uh, a chair like that, uh, you can not create with uh, classic manufacturing tools. So this was the first time that we got involved with 3D printing. Uh, so, a bit similar as, as concrete printing, but a, a sand mold printer with a binder. Uh, that was the closest thing we could find to uh, create this metal structure. It's an aluminium uh, chair. So, we could create all these kind of nice um, cooling channels that allowed the chair to cool down at one rate, so it wouldn't uh, start uh, pulling uh, apart during uh, the tension uh, there. And after that, of course, we did a lot of sanding and polishing, uh, which is always a, a, a nice uh, part of the job. Um, we, we did a lot of projects. Uh, many of uh, the projects were about 3D printing or algorithmic design. And, uh, and, and, and uh, one of the projects I want to show is the, is the metal printed uh, gradient chair, also an aluminum chair. So it's basically an evolution from, uh, from the bone chair. And it was the first time that there was a metal printer available uh, to do these kind of uh, kind of projects. So we, we completely optimized the, the chair. It's, it's very light in places where it doesn't need, so you can actually see through the, uh, the seat. But it has uh, a fully massive legs where, where it has all the forces uh, to deal with. 
Um, but, but we realized with this project that SLM, uh, selective laser melting, is not going to be the technology used for large-scale uh, structures. So we started thinking, so how can we uh, change this? How can we uh, find a, a way to print larger at lower cost, but also uh, with higher speed? Uh, so first we did a, a project with a robot and resin in, in 2012, 2013, and we still had that robot and then one of us uh, came to the idea why don't we hook a welding machine to it. And, and that's the technology that we're now developing. So we have a, a standard robot, standard welding machine, and we try to make that a 3D printer uh, with the software we add. Now we have uh, added a small component that uh, uh, takes in all the data from, uh, from the sensors, uh, but, but still a relatively simple machine compared to the high-cost SLM machines uh, that uh, were used to make the chair. And at first it was just about experimenting. So we wanted to see, uh, can we imitate the way we, we worked with the resin, so draw lines in mid-air uh, with metal. And uh, to our surprise and to the surprise of many of the welding experts that were helping us, it, it actually did work. As long as you took time and, and didn't think about material properties, but just uh, experiment to see how you could m make the next dot on the next dot and how you could make the toolpath to make all that work. So after these first ex experimentations, we realized that, okay, uh, we really need a little bit more software uh, to make this happen. So, so over the, the last four or five years, one of the things we've worked on most is, is uh, creating the software package. Um, this allows you to input an SDL file and then every step uh, is, is dealt with within one environment. Uh, unfortunately, other toolpath planners were, were not dealing with the specific problems that WireArc Additive Manufacturing had to deal with, and I'm sure with, with Concrete you have the same things. You have a couple of these specific things you have to do, and they are just not uh, dealt with with, uh, with the standard tools that are available. So it's, it's just a one workflow, and, and, and most importantly, it uh, uh, takes in process control so that you can, once you understand what's happening, you can feed that back into the... Is that me? So, um, so once, you, once you have all that data, you can start feeding it back into the slicer, and you can start improving the process based on the data, so data-centric data engineering in a way. So the first, uh, first object we made with this uh, was uh, the bicycle. It's an aluminum bicycle uh, launched in September, I guess. Um, and, and here we really uh, try to show uh, our audience for the first time. It's like, okay, we now have, uh, have this tool, so if you want to start printing for yourself, you can, uh, you can uh, knock on our door. And uh, that's, that's also what we're doing here at Forum Next, uh, so we get a lot of interest in that. But um, yeah, the same, the same themes are dealt with in, in every uh, object we're making. Um, so of course, uh, topological design is very important for us because every uh, kilo of metal we deposit, it takes an hour or half an hour. Uh, so we really need to save all the material we can. So it's not even an environmental idea or a, it's, it's just a, a pure time saving and, and making a bike like this now takes around 20 hours. Uh, so we, we start to get to a point where you can make metal objects like this, uh, specific additions, within a reasonable time frame. So we experimented a lot. Uh, it was great to uh, not be maybe engineers or architects and have this this uh, um, yeah this larger vision already to deal with. But we just uh, started playing around, uh, uh, discussing with artists what they wanted to make, and then telling them what our software could already do. And then uh, we we just started printing and. And, and doing it uh, helped us learning what this process really meant, what it could do and what it couldn't do. So we, we, we slowly developed a good idea of what metal 3D printing this way uh, could mean. Uh, so we have uh, several different strategies. So one, one is uh, printing lines and, and we could make a bar for uh, Herzog de Moron Museum in um, uh, Miami. So it's now uh, standing there. If you're ever there, it's a really nice place. The museum is a cool building. With a, with a nice bar uh, and a view on the, on the swamps there, so it's, it's a nice place for a, for a drink. But our biggest uh, project to date is, is the 3D printed bridge project. And we started with the same vision, so we said uh, once you have these robots, uh, why not 
just send them out in, in nature and, and let, them, let them build whatever uh, structure you need. Maybe you do some data analysis on the, on the red light district and you see, oh, we really need a bridge here and there to increase the, the, the flow of people. Uh, so you can just let them go and, they, and they'll build whatever. Um, uh, fortunately, probably uh, the, the city uh, quickly told us that we were not allowed to print uh, uh, such an innovative bridge uh, there uh, because uh, there's millions of visitors there and uh, they more uh, saw, quickly saw the dangers uh, of uh, a project there uh, than us. We also uh, developed a lot of the, the printing required for uh, the, the robots to crawl over the bridge to print horizontally, uh, but it... it yeah, it didn't really come together yet for this project. We think we could do it now, but the question is whether it would be an effective building of a bridge. So, um, we did this not alone. I mean, we, we definitely didn't have the skills in-house. We were makers, enthusiasts, but we weren't roboticists or uh, software specialists. Uh, we, we definitely didn't have the engineering power. Uh, so, so we gathered a whole group of people around us, and instead of uh, uh, signing thick contracts with IP clauses in there, we just said, what comes on the table is for everybody to use. You can do whatever you want. The only rule is that you contribute what you can from your uh, specific specialism. Uh, that worked really well. Uh, many of these partners are still uh, with us and, and included in, in new projects we do. Uh, this is the bridge we're replacing. Uh, quite, a, quite a simple bridge to replace uh, aesthetically. Uh, but we're, uh, we are uh, definitely confronted with a bridge that is very uh, well used. So you have uh, 15 million visitors, and it's not unlikely that the maximum load capacity of this bridge is actually being tested quite a lot of times. Uh, so that's also what we did in Twente uh, just this month with Imperial College and Twente University. We put uh, 20 tons on it. Uh, it, it maintained uh, perfectly, so that's... I believe 1.3 times the maximum load capacity that we, uh, we needed to go for. Uh, and then we also, to test our assumption, is uh, to see if that in real life would be sufficient, we put uh, as many people on as we could. And that was around 90 people, uh, six, seven tons, I think. So, yeah, we, we feel that we, uh, we uh, concluded a, a nice, uh, a conclusive test about uh, the stability of the bridge. So, uh, last uh, year, we also spent some time on the fracture mechanics module. Um, that was one of the, the parts that was more uh, complex to, to show to the city that also there is not, uh, not a problem. And, uh, uh, yeah, putting a sensor system in place to, to understand how the bridge is behaving while it's being used. So, as mentioned already, um, we went through an enormous design process. Uh, Joris Leimann and Arab had uh, almost two years uh, going from the original concept where, where you used the, the tree-like, bone-like uh, structure to, to hold up uh, uh, the bridge uh, from the current design, uh, to the current design. So, one of the reasons why this bridge eventually got uh, uh, kicked out was uh, the fact that uh, if you, if you uh, run into one of these members with a boat, uh, you can have a catastrophic failure. And because we, yeah, we didn't want to overdimension it that much more, uh, th this just didn't seem like a, a feasible solution. Also, we couldn't uh, put forces on the, on the canal walls. Uh, uh, yeah, one of them, at least, is uh, very old and there's no drawings. And they just said uh, there is no way you can put any forces on that side of the canal wall. So we had to put a bridge on the top. Uh, being uh, two years in the project, quite desperate, uh, money running out uh, really fast. Uh, we, uh, we said, okay, uh, we, we got Arab on board uh, as, a, as a big partner, and they, they started designing together with yours uh, from a much simpler concept uh, based on all the, the material research we had done by then. So we were two years in the project, so we had done a lot of buckling and, and, and tensile tests uh, to come up with uh, new models that showed that this design approach would be a very high chance of succeeding. In the meantime, even though uh, not all the scientists were agreeing with our approach, uh, we said uh, we're just going to start. Uh, we, uh, after two and a half years, we couldn't wait anymore. We just uh, wanted to show us and the world that we were able to print uh, the bridge as we, uh, as we said. Uh, so we just started printing. 
And uh, yeah, we, we also put the robot on top, not yet with a mobile uh, support, uh, uh, but we, we, we printed horizontal, which worked, but it was almost half a kilo per hour, and we rather had uh, around two kilos per hour as we had to deposit 6,000 kilos. So yeah, the gain uh, from uh, increasing the speed slightly uh, was, uh, was clear. Uh, so we chose, uh, it is the object to print a 3D bridge, uh, so let's print it in very big parts and then assemble it together. And the irony is that uh, the assembly lines, the seams that are manually welded by a construction company that does a lot of uh, stainless steel structures are uh, the, the, the worst uh, welds that are in this structure. And if it's going to break anywhere, which it's not going to, uh, but then it would be these welds uh, that are placed. So Arab has, uh, has uh, shown that together with Imperial that uh, these spots always come apart when you pull. So the, the next addition to the bridge is to uh, put a, a big sensor grid on it uh, with around 100 sensors. And the idea behind that is to, uh, one, have a, a good idea of how the health of this bridge is over time. But also to understand how such a monolithic structure, a steel structure with a quite special shape, is behaving when, when it's becoming hot, uh, loaded, when cold, uh, etc. And also maybe when there is uh, some, some changes in the structure, we can, we can uh, see that. But another, uh, another use case of all this data is that we can put it in a digital twin. And that digital twin is going to help us when we will build the next bridge. So we can constantly update the material properties that we use uh, for the design, but also uh, uh, understand uh, how the bridge uh, we made was behaving and see where we put too much uh, uh, material and where we could reduce. And we can all imitate new designs in this model to see whether they actually make sense. So, we hope that in, in a couple of iterations with a bridge like this, you can actually come up with a computer-aided uh, way of designing bridges. And uh, even though I don't believe that this means that the engineers and, and, and the architects are out of a job, but they definitely will have a, a shift in, the, in tasks in, in, in placing and, and designing a bridge like this. So what we think is that you, you will have algorithms like this where you, where you just say, okay, you have to span eight meters. Uh, these are the load case. You have to de depend on uh, the space where you go under is this. And then uh, just let me know what kind of options I have. Architects, uh, city can choose which one they like the best and, and, and go for that. And then the, the design and the engineering uh, can all take place in this one model. Uh, of course, once you start printing, you can log everything you do so you know exactly how it's printed. When you then censor the bridge and there is something that you don't really understand, you can go back in the logs and see how it is that the, the, the digital twin is different than the real uh, situation and you can start uh, researching that specific thing. Um, so maybe, maybe some of you have uh, already seen this, but uh, we, we made, uh, for October, we made a, a small video uh, to summarize everything we've done uh, so far, of course. In February, March, we hope uh, to, uh, to come out with a new one uh, where it's uh, actually on location. Um, uh, but this, w this was uh, um, yeah, uh, the whole part of the, the four, uh, four years of, uh, of development uh, where a lot of testing was involved, um, a lot of sensor, sensor trying and a lot of fun as well. So we uh, hope, uh, hope this project uh, can be repeated once more and then uh, we think uh, we can do it three times as fast and, uh, for uh, hopefully uh, four times less budget as well. Uh, so by then we, we also get into a zone where it's still an expensive bridge, but it's not that crazy anymore. And uh, hopefully uh, uh, that evolution will go on. So in, in 10 bridges, you will have a bridge that is just as expensive or even less uh, than, uh, than regular bridges. Of course, the, it, it, the design has to be optimized. I mean, it's now a very, big design with lots of metal in it and uh, you know for for a 3d printing concept you you probably want to take away all the metal that you can uh, even though the, the the handrails have a large function in in the in the structural um, uh, yeah soundness of this bridge uh, we definitely think we can we can make the next bridge with a lot less uh, printing time 
So what's next? Um, uh, yeah, MX3D has been has been uh, working on uh, on the background, as I said, on on the software we're making. We're also involved in uh, European projects where. Uh, Partners help us to close the loop. Uh, so, uh, on the design side, but also on the certification side, definitely not necessarily our specialty. Uh, but with these uh, 24 partners, uh, we have expertise of all these different sides. And, and that's also still how we think about this development. I mean, when we started, there was about 10 publications every year on one. Uh, now we have around 500. Um, uh, but this helps us. I mean, we, we read these uh, publications as well. Uh, so we, we really think that, uh, that, uh, um, yeah, uh, that new technology like this, you cannot do by yourself. It's with concrete as well. I've seen the, the amazing shoot up in the last couple of years, and that's all because everybody is publishing what they're doing, giving each other ideas, and moving quickly beyond uh, to, to a next phase. And uh, I thought the, the, the roof with the spray concrete uh, was, a, was a very nice, elegant concept, and it also economically, I could ma imagine that could, uh, could work well. Um, so what, what I've been uh, here at, uh, at Formnext, uh, so uh, we think that uh, printing large bridges, perhaps uh, uh, 3D metal printing is a relatively slow process, so that will take some time before that becomes economic. Um, uh, but definitely for, for a cubic meter size objects, a lot bigger than SLM, uh, but also not so big that it's uh, uh, five or six tons of metal. Uh, so we uh, took a robot arm, uh, we, uh, we scanned it in, we optimized it with the help of Altair, and then uh, we reprinted it 50% uh, lighter than, than the original part. Uh, to be fair, we didn't take in all the load cases, the maximum load case, but we just took in the load case that we needed. So the idea is really that you can now uh, make a custom arm that, uh, that ABB doesn't deliver because there is not enough interest in. But for a specific case, this could be a very good solution. Hopefully, we'll uh, send you uh, the movie where uh, we have uh, this whole uh, operation actually working. Uh, so uh, we have the whole robot. Uh, we're going to install it. Uh, hopefully, uh, the software uh, and the safety uh, uh, mechanisms in the robot are not going to uh, be a problem. Uh, but then uh, we can show uh, that this is a, a functional, uh, functional part. More relevant to uh, construction uh, is, uh, is the connectors we've been working on. So from the very beginning, for me, it was very clear that you couldn't print whole uh, houses or whole buildings, uh, but that in a, a parametrically designed structure, it does make sense to see if you can uh, print the, the, the places where everything comes together. So you use standard beams, but uh, the central point, uh, that is something that takes quite a lot of manual work. Um, labor in, in this kind of specialty is not so available anymore. Uh, so it's, it's quite likely that, uh, that we can achieve a level of, uh, of speed and, and, and quality that allows uh, the yeah, architects or, or um, steel structure makers uh, to start implementing these kind of solutions. So what we did here was a project with uh, Takanaka, is a Japanese uh, construction company, and they wanted to design a, a connector. Uh, they just said we have uh, four uh, wooden beams, they come uh, together like this, and we need to fill that design space in a functional way. Uh, so we used a similar optimization process, uh, we get uh, some, some hollow spaces in there to fill it with concrete, just like uh, bigger connectors are done uh, in, in, in uh, real life, and we printed it. And, and now, fortunately, uh, Takanaka was so happy with the result that uh, they, are, uh, they, they wanted uh, to implement it, and we're now working towards a plan to have it installed in a building uh, with a couple uh, more nodes uh, as soon as possible. Can't yet give a timeline on that, because we, uh, the safety, of course, here is uh, uh, just as big uh, an issue as with the, with the bridge. Uh, but this is our next big project. I do have a, a small video of this node, uh, which just came in, so I have to, it's still too big for the presentation. So I'll just show that as a closing part of the presentation.
Thank you. Obviously, uh, open for questions. I have one. Why do you use concrete in that steel structure? Well, it's a good question. I'm not an engineer, but uh, this is a, this is a, a strong demand for uh, for the Takanaka. They say uh, they do this uh, to uh, prevent uh, the the node from uh, from uh, uh, deforming under pressure. But I'm uh, I'm still uh, have to owe you the answer okay, on that. Okay. Well, so. you you were very honest by saying say um, this kind of question is something for these engineers. I think so. have to, uh, yeah. okay. I think it's 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 mainly uh, you know they they have done that before in other nodes similar like this so they they want to show Com that that's common, possible common, here as well. Common technology yeah. they're aware of and trust which is something which uh, with the um, Japanese uh, also works like this. Yeah. Questions? Any question? Come on, this can't be. This is super prominent. There we go. Um, I'm curious as to whether the topology optimization takes in, you said it takes into account different load cases. Uh, do you know, does it deal yep. with buckling, uh, vibrations and that kind of thing? You had people jumping on the bridge, so I'm wondering if that's accounted for or is that checked afterwards? Yeah, no. Well, I mean, uh, we uh, we rather not check that in uh, in real life. Uh, so we did all the tests uh, there. So yeah, the, I mean, there's not everything we can show, but we put not only the buckets of water on there, but we uh, we made some dynamic tests as well. And it's um, uh, yeah, we did uh, we did all the tests we could imagine that were required to convince the city uh, to believe that this. Uh, is a is a safer structure than than any of the bridges they have, uh, because of course for them it's also very exciting to put the bridge uh, in in the city center where it's so busy. Um, uh, they cannot afford any any failure on that. So we we did uh, every every test imaginable. With the maybe after the talk uh, we can uh, I can tell you who did it and who made the nice papers on that. And oh, if I may, um, could you talk about the material properties of the steel and how that differs from kind of normal duplex steel, is it, is it more brittle, for example? Um, the, the material properties change. So it, it, once you print it, it's not the same as, as cold rolled steel or uh, even as, as welded steel. Uh, but what we see is that uh, there is a very constant uh, properties that are, uh, for, for many cases, uh, uh, well beyond the, the, the benchmark of the, the welding wire. Uh, sometimes they're, they, they're a bit lower and in some direction. So you have, like with most 3D printing, there is a direction effect. Uh, but there is, a, there is good ways of designing for that, for instance, uh, making a di diagonal print uh, so that you can use uh, the forces in a different way. But, but even in, in, the, in the print direction, uh, uh, it's a very workable uh, metal that uh, has uh, constant uh, uh, values. But um, uh, Vittoria there uh, next to, uh, next to you uh, can tell you more about that. <laughs> this is a good blazing. <laughs> Jörg. Okay, thank you very much. I'm looking on your projects with a little bit of envy. Uh, but talking about our building authorities, I think it's very smart to include the monitoring because we have a new technology, we don't know everything about the material and about the structure. So I'm wondering what kind of sensors you use and how you make sure that these sensors will stay there for years? 50 years. Yeah. Uh, not 50 years, but years. Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of uh, uh, things to say on that. So we use the, the, the regular sensors that you use for a bridge health monitoring system. So, um, uh, well, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show you the list uh, for that uh, after. But uh, the, the, um, the idea there is that it is a very simple and robust system. That's, that's also what TU20 is doing now. So we, we made, uh, for the Dutch Design Week, we made a, a, an initial concept. It worked. Uh, we, we had all the, the, the software behind it that, uh, that made it work. Uh, and then now we, we're making it ruggedized. So uh, it's in the, in the red light district. Uh, so you need uh, no, no chance for anyone to be able to touch it. So we're actually going to close it up on the bottom, which is a bit of pity because of the design. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, for the for the sensing, it's important. Uh, wh one other uh, aspect we have agreed with the city is that we uh, we measure the bridge. Uh, it's it's not a 50-year project, but a five-year project. 
um, that made it all a, a bit easier. And of course, uh, we hope after five years that, uh, that all the data shows that it can easily stay longer. Uh, but we, can, we cannot prove now yet that it is, it is a 50-year uh, bridge, but this data hopefully shows that there is there's no uh, change in behavior over time. So that's going to help us there. But uh, I'll, I'll uh, um, inform you on the sensors we used after. They're going to have contact anyhow in uh, the next steps. Uh, no, I'm not going to... Uh, sorry, Harald. We're running just three quarters of an hour late, so uh, let me push a bit. Sorry. <laughs> I'm super happy that you showed this. The interesting thing is uh, the artist is coming to push something. So this is really an, uh, um, yeah, not trying to find a typical engineering way of finding money, finding money different than coming with a different attitude, not only having the structure design as an aspect, that really gives an impact. And that's actually something which we need a lot more in these kind of environment, more projects which are asking what we can do with it. Yeah, just, I think uh, we, we, we change the, the, the way we approach such an innovation project. We just want to see if we can realize it first and then we can find a use case for it. And that's, uh, super, super nice. Thank you thanks. for coming.